each uh, year the Central Indiana Association of Life Underwriters brings to our campus a speaker. This is always during a life insurance week. Uh, this year they uh, done us an especially interesting assignment by bringing to us the governor of the state of Indiana. And it's my pleasure to recognize first uh, Jack Peckinpah, who was the president of the group which brings the governor. Jack. And then to have that rare privilege that a president of a state institution of higher education always looks forward to, that is, presenting the governor of the state. As you would expect, the governor and any other individual who travels as much as he does and has these speaking engagements to make has a, a biographical sketch that's sent out. Now, I'm not going to stick to this sketch, but I will give you some of these things. He was elected as uh, the governor of the state, of course, in 1956, and this is the last year of his term. And this is... Uh, period in which he has been the governor of the state has been one in which uh, there have been some very good things happen in the state of Indiana from the standpoint of the state's economic base. Uh, and this is, of course, the top, uh, topic for the discussion today. Indiana has led the nation for the six consecutive years in its per capita plant expansion and is now attracting new industries at the rate of 17 per month. Uh, this uh, fact has been stressed by the governor and other individuals in the state including those in our groups in economics on the campus, uh, as one of the reasons why uh, the Ball State and its part of the state has been growing as rapidly as it has. Uh, the governor, of course, was uh, is a native of Laporte. He was graduated from Laporte High School and from Indiana University in 1932 with an A.D. degree in economics. He has honorary degrees from Indiana, from Franklin College, from tri State from Balfour and from Vincennes. He was elected to the Indiana Senate in 1940, but resigned after the 1941 session to serve four years in the 85th Infantry Division, the United States Army, and uh, came out of service a lieutenant colonel. Then he went back into the Indiana legislature and served until he was made lieutenant governor, and then, of course, uh, now the governor of the state of Indiana. His uh, business at home before he uh, entered this uh, realm of legislation and politics was the wholesale furniture business at Laporte, where his father and his grandfather had operated a furniture factory previous to his assisting them. The governor's married. His children are of high school age, a son 14 and a daughter 11. Uh, he has a long list of the memberships, starting with the Presbyterian Church and ending with the Moose and the Lions. I won't read all of them to you. It's a very real pleasure to present the governor of the state of Indiana, the Honorable Harold Handley. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emmons, and ladies and gentlemen of Ball State. The fact that I'm here uh, under the sponsorship, as it were, of the Indiana Association of Life Underwriters doesn't mean that my premiums are any less or that I will get any insurance any cheaper. <clears throat> I have not had the opportunity to uh, speak to your convocation before during my term as governor, and so I welcome this chance to come to this great school. Jack told you, Jack, Dr. Emmons told you about you see, we're very close friends. I call him Jack. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't uh, used to call my, my president uh, by his first name when I went to Indiana University, although since that time we are the closest of friends, Herman Wells. But I recall sitting in convocation, and uh, it wasn't on a voluntary basis when I went to school, so I'm rather flattered that so many of you would take your time to come over here to hear me speak this morning. We talk about problems of government and we still have family problems, too, as well, and uh, Dr. Emmons told you about my daughter. She's uh, 11 years old, and uh, a few years ago, when we first moved into the mansion, she would go around the neighborhood telling everybody she was the governor's daughter. And my wife, Barbara, didn't think too much of it, so one day she got in the kitchen. She said, honey, I don't want you to ever say, it, say that again. Don't you ever tell anybody you're the governor's daughter. And so that afternoon at a tea, a woman leaned over and said, Honey, aren't you the governor's daughter? And she said, Well, I thought I was until this morning, and then Mommy told me I wasn't. 
So we, we have problems within the family, too. But I can recall my college days and my hopes for the future and my aspirations and also my financial status. And it was just as bad as most every student in college uh, experiences, I presume, today. And when I got married, I'll never forget when I, my dad was sitting behind me and when I repeated the words with the, uh, all my worldly goods I thee endow, I heard my dad lean over to my mother and say, well, there goes his bicycle, and that's about what I had. <laughs> but in this political life, you have to have an objective, and you should have an objective. I know that sometimes in public life, the recipient of many jibes, and believe me, in this life you receive them, the good once in a while with a lot of the bad, but criticism is the American way, and it's expected, and that's the way it should be. But a congressman recently told me uh, he'd been having some trouble, and he said, I had an answer for this fellow. He came up to me, and he said, you know, I wouldn't uh, vote for you if you were St. Peter. And the congressman said, well, if I were St. Peter, you wouldn't have the opportunity because you wouldn't be living in my district. <laughs> uh, so those answers sometimes are are very, very good ones and very important. But you're on the threshold, of course, of a very active and busy life. You think you have a very busy life now, and you do. But you don't have the responsibilities that will be upon your shoulders within the very, very short period of the next few years. I always think, and this is no reflection on <clears throat> a coach or, or any uh, ball player, but... Uh, they tell this story about the coach that went to see the dean of men, and he said, Dean, I'm having a rough time with John. Uh, he's got to play football Saturday, and I need him. And uh, he said, I know his scholastic standing's terrible, but won't you give him a quick examination and get him up to par so he can play? The dean said, I'll be glad to, <clears throat> because we want to win that game Saturday. So he brought John in, and for about an hour, he went over everything, and it was all very frustrating because he couldn't get the right answers. And Finally, he said, all right, John, so what are six and six? And John said, 13. <clears throat> the coach said, oh, Dean, let him go. He only missed it by two. <laughs> <clears throat> now, the point I want to make with that story is the fact that we can't afford to miss any opportunity. Opportunities are available to every one of you because in this great free America, there are ample opportunity. What you have to do, of course, is as you get out into your future occupations and your life ahead is to forget any disappointments and failures you might have. You have to forget them and live an active and a creative life because uh, it isn't uh, what life does to you, but it's what you do to life that is important. And here in this atomic age, in this nuclear age, when these terrific responsibilities are almost more than the human mind can stand or endure, the responsibilities of the freedoms of the world, the future of our civilization, will be resting upon your shoulders. And so you have to decide early that you're going to live an affirmative and a positive life, which, of course, is most important. Now we talk about this particular age and time. I know that there are many different philosophies and many different theories of economics and theories of government, theories of economics, but they all add up to one thing and one thing only, that in this present time we are in a transitory period. We're going through a great transition in our social fabric here in this great country of ours. Because after all, we have what we call now automation. And with automation, with all of the research, with all of the technical know-how, in this transitory period, we have to realize that there are certain areas where replacements are made or great movements of of mass humanity are made because of 
technological advances. And so it does take some patience. But with that patience in the American way, we will achieve and accomplish. Because over the years, this great country of ours has accomplished and achieved more than any other country or civilization in all history. But we have to do it in a positive way, not negative. I get a little tired of reading and hearing of people who are always criticizing, who are always trying to tear down our institutions or our public leaders, who have nothing constructive to say. Constructive criticism is the healthiest thing that we have and the healthiest factor of our republic, constructive criticism. And of course, when we talk about economics, and I presume that many of you are uh, studying economics as well as other courses, but in this day and age, and I majored in economics when I went to school at Indiana University, I'll never forget one of my friends and went back to see our old economics professor and uh, he looked at a set of questions that were on his desk, and he said, why, for heaven's sake, those are the same questions you gave us uh, uh, 25 years ago. Don't you ever change the questions in this course? And he said, I don't have to. This present day and age, all I do is change the answers. And that's true in economics. It's absolutely true. And we have to realize it in this transitory period. But you're motivated here in college by a desire to improve yourselves, to take a positive approach, to accomplish and to achieve. Your this word motivated. How many times do you hear a speaker use that? Sometimes, I don't know why I use it, but I like to describe and explain what uh, the significance of the word. You know, there's a fellow that used to go home every night and go around this graveyard. And uh, it took him about 15 minutes longer, so one night he decided it was a beautiful moon out. He thought he'd go through the cemetery and see how it worked. Well, he got home 15 minutes earlier, so every night he did the same thing, and it worked beautifully. And uh, this one particular night, it was black, it was just as dark as it could be, and they had dug a grave right by this path, and he tumbled in. Well, he went through every maneuver in the book, tried to get out, and he couldn't make it. So finally he said, well, I'll sit down, and tomorrow morning at daybreak, somebody will get me out. Well, about that time, another character coming along the path fell into the same pit. Well, the second one that fell in didn't see the first one sitting quietly over in the corner. And he tried every maneuver to get out, too. And finally, the first one said to the second, who still didn't know he was in the pit, he said, Well, brother, you ain't going to get out of here. But he did. <laughs> you see, he was motivated. Now, that, that's, what, that's what I mean by motivation. But in your motivation... You've got to remember one thing. You have to attain an objective. And I know many of you here are interested not only in economics and in your future profession, but you're interested as well in government. And government is so highly, highly important in this day and age. And you have a great responsibility to government. Abraham Lincoln, of course, as you know, we celebrated his sesquicentennial last year. This is the 151st year. It was my privilege to be chairman of the Lincoln Sesquicentennial Commission in the state of Indiana, an ex officio chairman, and as, uh, in that role I went to Japan last December, and uh, then on to Manila, Hong Kong, and went on around the world. And it was interesting to learn of the great love that these people throughout the world had for Abraham Lincoln. Because Abraham Lincoln stood for something. He stood for constitutional government. He stood for progress in a moderate way. And he's the man that saved the union of this country so that this country has now been able to achieve and accomplish the responsibility of leading the free world. Now, the one thing that he said when he was going to his first inaugural and he stopped at the old Bates House, which is now the Clay Food Hotel, as many of you know in Indianapolis. There's a plaque on the northwest uh, corner of the Clay Food Hotel. 
And this is what he said, and is what is on that plaque, that I appeal to you constantly to bear in mind that not with politicians, not with presidents, not with office seekers, but with you shall the union and shall the liberties of this country be preserved to the latest generation. Not with politicians, not with presidents, not with office seekers, but you the people. So you see, it's your responsibility, the responsibility of each and every one. Now, I've taken a very definite stand, and I've been criticized for it. But in my own heart, my own conscience, I believe that I'm right. And somebody else across the table from me believes that he is right. And so as a result, we have two great parties in this country, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. And I think that it goes without saying that both parties and, and all candidates and all office holders within the framework of these two great parties have the same objective, and that's the security of our American system. But we just believe that there are different ways to achieve it. We, for instance, believe that we can only achieve and secure it in one direction, they in the other. But what happens overseas when somebody gets a little unhappy with his party and he doesn't think too much of its philosophy, he starts off and goes in another direction and creates and forms another party. So you've got a splinter party system in France and Germany and Italy and throughout the world. Splinter party system as opposed to our two-party system in this country. And that's the reason that they always seem to be in such a, as we call it here in this country, a hassle. They are going in all directions. How many governments did France have before de Gaulle with his strength took over? Italy's been having their terrific troubles and their growing pains. And of course, the division of Germany is well known. And there's no country as West Germany that has shown to the world what the free enterprise system, individualism and initiative and hard work can do more than West Germany. But I just mentioned that fact that constructive criticism, no matter what your party might be, is helpful and it's important. But my interest, of course, is in the future of this country. And I happen to be in agreement, and we're all in agreement, a great section of the population of this country. We're concerned about the fact that we have a $750 billion mortgage on the future of each and every American in this country. We're somewhat concerned that some of our people in high places are more interested in the byproducts of our constitutional form of government than they are in keeping the strength of the fabric of this government intact. And I speak about many schemes that might go into the uh, area of welfare help. It's important. I'm not opposed to it if we can afford it. But if we can't afford it, you can't bankrupt this country at the expense of making the byproduct more important than the fabric of good constitutional government. Yes, I've been accused of being a conservative. Well, I consider myself a liberal, and, that, and there's going to be a great deal of laughter uh, throughout the state when I make that statement. But you know why I call myself a liberal? Because I'm defending the very things that were the product of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Industrial Revolution of this great country, the freedoms of man, the dignity of the soul. I don't consider myself in the category of those who want to have super centralized control to control the activities of every person's life and to return us once more back to centralized government destroy the fabric of our 51 states, as you please, the sovereign states, and have one federal government run the whole show. So we're all in the same boat. I, it could happen and it may not happen. Because as I say, 
There's a great play for the control of men's minds, not only in the United States of America, but throughout the world. And here in America, up to this point, we have been doing everything on a voluntary basis, by volition, against the compulsion that seems to be the byword of those dictatorships across the sea. Yes, we're all in the same boat. Agriculture, labor, industry, we're on this boat known as a capitalistic system. Some place along the way, some years ago, somebody decided the word capitalism was a bad, bad word. But capitalism, in my mind, has brought about the achievements and accomplishments that put this country in the position that it's in. And capitalism doesn't mean that we can't do the many things that we want to do for our people and for our groups, minority groups as well, as long as we can afford them. And when anybody comes up to me and says, I want this and I want that, and I can't understand why we can't have it, and why are you opposed to it? And then in the next press, say, I'm getting so doggone tired of paying high taxes. Inconsistency. Now, we can do these things if the people will decide they want to pay for it. And it's just as simple as that. But we're all in the same boat. I think about this boat that was sailing out over the, over the Atlantic Ocean, and it was sinking. This fellow was standing up, looking at the horizon. didn't seem to bother him at all. Didn't bother him at all. Everybody else was down on their knees praying. And finally, one person looked up and said, Say, friend, why don't you get on your knees and pray too? He said, What for? The boat doesn't belong to me. There are an awful lot of people in the country today that feel that way. They don't seem to have any interest. And that's why I feel that it's so important that every one of you accept the responsibility not only of your profession, but also the responsibility of your community, your state, and your national activity. You know, I talked a few minutes ago about this great country and these great sovereign states. In France, as you know, there's a national government. In England, the sovereignty of the people, as you know, are entrusted to one central state, the parliament. But here in the United States of America, we now have 51 states, 50 sovereign states and the federal republic. And because of the constitutional requirements wherein each state is a part of that federal government, we have been able to achieve and accomplish unity of purpose, national unity of purpose. After all, our Constitution has only been subjected to 22 amendments, but only two of them have been designed to restrict still further the power of federal government. Only two of them, the income tax and prohibition. And Article 4, and I'm going to not go on in such a uh, talk on governmental uh, uh, in government, but I, I think this is so important that Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, that the U.S. shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. The federal government has no powers save those granted to it by the states, and the states have all powers of government save those denied them by the Constitution. Now, to me, that is the most important, one of the most important, important articles of the Constitution. Why do I say that? Not because I'm a governor of a state, but because I believe it. I believe that the fabric of this American society of ours is dependent upon decentralization. I think it's dependent on the fact that we have 50 republics that can control a super republic known as the federal government. And the results of all this, of this creation by the Constitution and our founding fathers, 
has made man equal before his God and the laws of the land. More than any other country or civilization in history, made him equal. Not because he is a Jew, a Gentile, not because he's a farmer or a laborer, not because of race, creed, or color, but because our society recognizes the dignity and personality of the soul of every free man in this American classless society. And that, to me, certainly is fundamental and basic. I think there are ten words that I want to leave with you that describe the art of every civilization known throughout history. And none of us in this auditorium, not a one of us, believes that ours is the only civilization that ever inherited this earth. There have been thousands of them that have been ground into the dust of time. There have been billions of human atoms that have trekked across the face of this globe and gone down the corridors of eternity. So we're not the only ones. But we could learn by experience if we want to, if we are not so selfish about our own personal whims and desires and think about the whole of mankind, we could learn by experience. And these ten words describe the rise, the arc, and the fall of every civilization throughout history. Number one, they all start out in bondage. That's a known, a known fact. Make a study of any civilization. And that civilization starts out with its peoples in bondage. And being in bondage, of course, these peoples have so little hope, but they do have just enough to acquire a certain amount of faith as they look to the heavens. And with that faith, they always acquire courage. If you have faith, you'll have courage to do something. And when you do acquire courage to strike out on your own, then you can attain for yourselves liberty. And once you have liberty, you're able to go in any direction because you have the freedoms and the liberties to do so. And in so doing, you acquire a certain amount of abundance. And once you acquire abundance, then, and we're right in that position of the ark right now, then unfortunately these civilizations then feel a great degree of selfishness. They've got a lot and they want more. And so agriculture, looking out for their own interests, Labor, look out for their own interests. Industry, look out for their own interests. Each profession, each segment of the economy, look out for their own interests in a selfish sort of a way, forgetting about the fabric of the whole. And once they become selfish through abundance, and they do have it, then they become complacent. They don't seem to care too much because these groups will take care of their every need. And once they become complacent and they have no interest whatsoever in the future of their own community, state, or nation, or the free world, then they become dependent because they get themselves into the position where they have to depend on a centralized control to run their lives. And when they depend on that, there's nothing more for them to think about, to worry about. It's all there. Then they become apathetic. They don't care anymore. Apathy. The worst of the ten. And once that happens, through apathy, every civilization has gone once again into bondage. Those ten words of the arc of a civilization, bondage, faith, courage, liberty, abundance, Selfishness, complacency, dependency, apathy, and back to bondage again. Our forefathers fought a bloody revolution 
They maintained it by a desperate civil war. We've been through several wars since. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost for one purpose. That's to maintain the liberties and freedoms of the individual American citizen. Heaven help us if we lose that now, after all of these years, through an apathetic attitude of an I don't care attitude brought about by a paternalistic, centralized super government that spawns nothing but bureaucracy that will control your life and mine, and that we forget through the fat of wealth and social hopes that we destroy the fabric that has created the opportunity for us to do something about it. So I hope that each one of you will rededicate yourselves to your flag and your country based on the combined values of the Ten Commandments, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution of the United States. Thank you very much.